Lovers of Lore, thank you for joining me for this mega installment of the March of the Machine storyline. We're actually taking a bunch of the different installments of the story and putting them together to paint a bigger picture of what's going on in the multiverse overall during this Phyrexian invasion. So we're diving in with the first plane being Innistrad. And this part revolves around Geralt the Stitcher and Gisa the Ghoul Caller. Now, they both deal with raising the undead. So, they are not really afraid of dealing with monstrosities normally, but the Phyrexians are proving to be something different. Geralt's Stitcher zombie magic can't actually reanimate Phyrexians. And Gisa can reanimate them, but only as long as she's fully focused on it as soon as she stops focusing, the body collapses back down to the ground. So Giralf is the one who learns about Phyrexia's nature and explains it to his sister. Their undead are immune to Phyrexian oil because they need live minds to be converted into Phyrexians. The two siblings battle Phyrexia. Three-headed stitcher freaks along with crag turtles that have eagle's wings that drop from the sky and explode. And Gisa, for her part, used all of the death energy that was hanging in the air due to all the lost lives, drew it into herself, and then pushed that down in the ground, using it to pull up a gigantic necrotic drake from the mire. And she was smug for a moment when she launched it into the air, but then it turned out the Phyrexians also had a drake of their own, and it rose up from their ranks and engaged her drake. The Phyrexians had been keeping it in reserve. So the Phyrexian drake rips out the necrotic drake's guts as they're flying up in the air, but this makes the necrotic drake lighter, so it's able to rise up in the sky faster and gain the advantage. It ends up biting the head off of the Phyrexian. Both of them hit the ground. The necrotic drake's already dead though, so it's fine, but it can't fly anymore. It can still fight, however, so it keeps wrecking Phyrexians. Jarolf sends in this giant towering monstrosity that he had stitched together. It had antlers, gross leathery skin, and legs made out of bears. Even under these circumstances, Gisa couldn't handle her brother having a better toy. So she sent her power coursing deeper, seeking something even bigger than he had made. And the ground heaved as a massive nine-clawed crab lobster beast corpse burst forth. It starts tearing off heads and bisecting Phyrexians. And geese is there just cackling until the Phyrexians start hacking away at the beast's legs and it collapses. And then Geralt's titan ends up being toppled the same way. Phyrexia just had so many troops to bring in and throw into the meat grinder. So they formed a new plan. She would hold off the Phyrexians while he stitched their two abominations together into a mega abomination. Half crazy titan, half crazy crab lobster monster. Its reinforced legs carried into the battle where it laid waste to all of the Phyrexians. And that part of the story ends with the two of them burning all the Phyrexian corpses and resuming their usual bickering. Next up, we check out what's going on in Eldraine. And we start out with Chulane. He's trying to warn of danger, but wherever he's going, he's being mocked for it and pelted by rocks. But he's also being followed by a malevolent fae who's also a trickster by the name of Rankle, who wants to rob him for his gold. Because Rankle basically got ousted by his own followers, and he figures he can do well if he can just get his hands on some gold. So he's following Chulane all the way to Lockthwain, but he gets caught by Chulane trying to take his gold. That, however, gets interrupted when a carriage comes rolling up, and in the carriage is Ayara. So Chulane explains to her the danger, and Ayara invites him into her carriage, and they ride off leaving Rankle behind. But here's the thing. Rankle, when he saw Ayara, he was instantly in love. So, being the ridiculous individual he is, 
he sets out to find a love potion. He heads off to the location where a known witch is, and he starts to take her potions and smash them on the ground, demanding to be given a love potion. The witch wanted nothing to do with it and didn't actually have love potions, so she basically at first tried to get Rankel to join forces against the Phyrexian incursion she was explaining was happening on Eldraine, but Rankel wasn't having it. He only wanted Ayara. So the witch told him about something called the long-lasting lilac of longing, which was most likely made up. But Rankel ends up getting attacked looking for this maybe real, maybe not real flower. A Phyrexian dog comes at him, but he's saved by Torbran the dwarf. Torbran entreats Rankel to join forces against Phyrexia. Rankel pretends he's going to go along with it, but ultimately just ends up stealing a magic ring that belongs to Torbran in a really funky way. He sprinkles magic dust on it that turns the ring into a caterpillar while Torbran is asleep, and then the caterpillar creeps over to Rankel. When Torbran realizes that Rankel's stolen his ring, he almost cries. It's a ring of wishes. Rankel wasted one of the wishes on a basket of cookies. He used a second wish on a love potion. At this point, Torbran is freaking out. There's only one wish left. It had already been explained that the wishes weren't powerful enough to completely oust Phyrexia, but did have a high level of power inside the world of Eldraine. Rankel does not expend the final wish, however, and they head off together towards Lockthwain, where Ayara lives. When they get to Lockthwain, they find it crashed and ruined. The once beautiful flying castle is now just pieces on the ground. But even worse than that, Knights of Lockthwain are visible, and they are visibly Phyrexian. And Ayara appears, and she too has fully been given over to Phyrexia. It was at this point that Rankle rethought the entire love potion and getting together with Ayara. Torbran, for his part, is begging for the ring. And now that Rankle's no longer interested in Ayara, he actually agrees and starts to hand the ring over. But at the last second, he shouts, I wish it would rain! And Torbran yells out, You've doomed us all! But Rankle hadn't actually finished his sentence. I wish it would rain this! He said, holding up the love potion. And sure enough, sweet pink love came cascading down on the Phyrexians. Rankle basked and bellowed, Behold your king! The Phyrexians, as one, looked up at him adoringly, climbing over each other, trying to reach them. Rankle led them as they strained to reach their love. He took them to the edge of a chasm, where he hovered, and watched them fall like lemmings, adoringly to their deaths. After all those Phyrexians were dead, a massive glamour fell over everyone, and they went to sleep. Rankle assumed it was part of Torbrand's plan, and he fell asleep very pleased with himself. Thus ends the antics of Rankle on Eldraine. Now we move over to Zendikar. Nahiri is here, leading the Phyrexian invasion. The Skyclave in Ameria has become her home base. She's using it to connect Zendikar's hedrons and tear a much bigger entryway for Phyrexia. Zendikar itself fights back against her presence. The Royal, which is essentially an avatar of Zendikar's spirit, lashes out at her. But Nahiri's lithomancy has been enhanced by Phyrexia's power. So she quells Zendikar's rage, blunts its blade, chokes off its magma at the source. The royal bucks and lashes, but ultimately gives up. Nahiri ends up restoring the Skyclave and infuses it with Phyrexian essence. The Hedrons start to bleed oil, and this opens the way for endless waves of invading Phyrexians. Zendikar was starting to die. A group of defenders from Seagate, Akiri, Tazri, Linvala, Aura, and Kaza, all snuck together into the Skyclave seeking Nahiri. They were attacked by a corrupted nature elemental. They tripped it up with their ropes and cut it apart. There were a number 
of these different elementals that had been corrupted by Nahiri spread through the Skyclave. And in one encounter, Aura ends up getting oil on him. He's doomed. But they continue to press forward bravely regardless. They encountered an area with dozens of the elementals, and Limvala releases holy energy, which radiates out from her and drives them back. Meanwhile, Nahiri finds that she can't progress further in her plan without physically merging with the Skyclave. So she fuses herself into the Skyclave's keystone. That's actually how the defenders of Zendikar find her. A horror melded into the stone itself. Their weapons can't reach her. Her lithomancy makes stone jump up and block every attempt. And at the same time, Nahiri strikes back. Things get desperate. The halo bottles around everyone's necks start to glow and burn. And the Phyrexian corruption actually burns off of Aura's hand. While this is happening, Limvala glows even brighter than the halo. Nahiri is stunned, and a voice tells Tazri to go, attack now. The others provide a distraction as Tazri runs up. She knows her sword is useless, but the bottle of halo whispers to her, Use me, quick! Tazri throws the halo at Nahiri. A great burst of light occurs, and the keystone crumbles. Nahiri collapses, and the Skyclave itself cracks in half. The group of Zendikar defenders manage to escape using Akiri's rope and Kaza's magical flight. The fight for Zendikar continued. They had a chance now. All right, my friends, that ends this installment of the March of the Machines storyline. I hope you've enjoyed roaming the multiverse and taking a peek at what's going on in different locations. Tomorrow, we're going to have more of the main storyline. In the meantime, go enjoy some more stories on this channel. If you like what we're doing here, you can support us by joining the channel membership or the Patreon. Big shout out to the channel's members and patrons. Thank you very much for supporting what we do here. I will see you all next time. And in the meantime, remember my friends, lore is life.